Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Laura Prada from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We'll begin with the news. Stay with us. A cross-party committee has been created by the members of the National Assembly in Ecuador to investigate its president, Elizabeth Cabezas. The committee was approved, but with 123 votes in favor and one abstention. Now three assembly members will have to investigate the president of the assembly accused of blocking a probe against President Lenin Moreno. An audio was leaked in March where Cabezas was heard talking to Interior Minister Maria Paula Romo, allegedly about the votes needed to prevent the investigation. This concerns the President of the National Assembly. We have to defend the institution. We do not have to be confused about this. This is not a criminal case. Recently, we received an important recommendation from the Observatory of the Legislative Power, and the reform of the legislative function is clear. These determination processes do not require to verify the legality of the evidence because we are not handling a judicial case here. And still in Ecuador, workers at a plantation company are demanding that the authorities help them reach a settlement in their dispute with the company. The Furukawa Plantation Company, which exports abaca fiber used to make specialized paper, was closed in February. It was accused of labor abuses that amounted to modern slavery. Denise Herrera tells the story. Jose has been working at the Furukawa Plantation Company since 1999. He lives in a single room with his family and one of the company's plantations. He says, but the workers' conditions have caused serious injuries among the employees. And he complains that the company has never fulfilled its obligations. Everyone wants to leave. I want to leave too. Recently, I heard that Furukawa is going to fix the camps and they will give us $500 a month. No one will accept that. We are already in terrible conditions. Walter is one of those helping the Furukawa employees. He says they just want the workers' right to be respected. The company is now closed. It would very bad if opens again in two months and the workers have to go back to the same thing. And at this point, the state should have a plan for the workers. Various organizations in defense of human and workers' rights are also supporting the employees. If the state does nothing to punish the company, if it doesn't insist that the company pays them what they are legally entitled to and pays for the abuses it has committed, then the state will be an accomplice to the systematic violation of human rights at Furukawa Company. The owner of Hurukawa argues that the company has turned Ecuador in the world's second biggest exporter of avocado fiber and that it has met all its commercial tax and labor obligations. However, the workers are warning of new violations of their rights. We know that Furukawa is planning to destroy the workers' camps and leave them on the streets. These people already live in miserable condition and they have nowhere to go apart from these camps. Our rights must be respected. There are children and teenagers who have been raped in the camp. My daughter was raped and they don't understand. I will not allow this as long as I live. The workers say they want talks at the highest level to find a peaceful solution. They also accuse the government of protecting the company's interests while it abuses its workers' rights. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. And now we talk about Venezuela because high officials have met between Russia and Venezuelan high officials have met, have held the first bilateral economic and business forum in Moscow uh, to express in cooperation between both countries. Our correspondent Hans Eloro was there and has the details for us. In the framework of this fourth Venezuelan-Russian joint commission, the two delegations developed the first business economic forum to contribute to commercial development in the industrial area 
and the supply from Russia of a variety of pharmaceutical and agro-food products. This is part of an strategic alliance between both countries that in words of Tatiana Moskova, general director of this commission, it is without a doubt the way to strengthen the bilateral relations. Nearly 300 businessmen participated in this event from both the private and the state sector of this Euro-Asiatic nation. Venezuelan Minister of Agriculture Wilmer Castro Soteldo also participated. He pointed out that it's necessary to expand the economic horizons between these two countries and maintain the warranty around 60 percent of the wheat that comes from Russia to Venezuela. Minister Castro Soteldo also spoke about the exchange of technology and to enhance the mechanization and modernization of this sector in the Bolivarian nation. The topic of fertilizers also was addressed, a strong issue that Venezuela is negotiating with Russia. The Minister of Planning, Ricardo Menendez, mentioned that this strategic alliance could also contribute to modernization and provide security to the Venezuelan electrical system, especially taking in account the computer attacks that occur at the Guri hydroelectric power plant. More important agreements between these two countries will be signed, one related to the supply of pharmaceutical products, another in reference to the transportation sector. And the Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza ended his two-day visit to Syria. He started the trip at the Unknown Soldier Monument where he left her with in homage to Syrian soldiers who gave their lives in defense of the nation. The Venezuelan official was received by the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad. Our correspondent Hishan Wanus was there and has the details on the following report. Venezuela's foreign minister Jorge Arreaza arrived at the Damascus International Airport early on Thursday for a two-day official visit. Arias has started his trip with a visit to the monument to the unknown soldier. There he laid a floral offering in the name of every Syrian soldier that lost his life during the civil war battle in the Islamic State. The foreign minister also met with the country's president Bashar al-Assad to talk about the current situation in Venezuela and the bilateral agreements between the two nations. It is expected now that Arias and his counterpart Walid al-Mualem hold a press conference. The Venezuelan foreign minister will visit the University of Damascus, where he will speak with students and its professors and also promote agreements in research. This is the first visit of Areasa to Syria after eight years of civil war. Thank you, Hicham. And a new case has opened against Brazil's former president, Michel Temer, for allegedly money laundering. A federal judge in Sao Paulo accepted the case after a request was filed by the prosecutor's office. With, which, with, with, with this, Temer would be facing four lawsuits and an investigation for six other cases. Former Brazilian President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva left office in 2011 with an approval rating of 87 percent, the highest in the nation's history. From his first day in office, he fought against inequality across all social levels. Let's find out more in the second part of our series looking at the life and the work of the Latin American leader. Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, the most popular president Brazil has ever had, will have been in prison for one year on April 7th. The goal of his arrest was to damage his reputation and put a stop to his return to politics. Lula was in power for 10 years in the largest country in Latin America and was beloved by most. He won the 2002 elections after 22 years of fighting and building the Workers' Party. He will tell us we cannot err. What did he mean by that? A rule must focus on the poor and the working class. We have to break the state tradition of serving the rich. From 2003 to 2011, Lula's government stabilized the economy, lowered the unemployment rate, as well as the public debt, and brought Brazil onto the international stage. During his terms in office, nearly 30 million people were pulled out of poverty, and a similar number uh, got access to electricity. He did not back down from anyone. No institution, no provocation. Lula battled against hunger and confronted ignorance, and he did so to overcome these issues. He fought to give us a Brazil that we have never had. He thought about doing good. 
in offering opportunities for everyone. He thought of the people who had the least and the most vulnerable, who needed the state to help them out of misery. The caravans that supported him were like a lifeline. That support gave him energy during the worst times. He loved to be in direct contact with people. According to his friends, Lula found strength in becoming the hope that would trump fear. Lula is someone who, on two occasions, traveled throughout the whole of Brazil, from north to south, through thousands and thousands of kilometers. He wanted to meet people, to learn from them, to see what challenges they faced. In 2017, Lula once again carried out these caravans. Now, at a time when he cannot join us, we decided to retake the caravans. Before he was in prison, Lula used to say, if something happens to me, you will be my legs. If something happens to me, I will talk to the Brazilian people through your voice. His comrades don't see Lula as a conventional leader. He's a symbol of the workers' struggle, recalling the words of his mother. He used to tell him to always keep his head up. He has such dignity that it scare away opponents and which continues to guide the work of activists. With these images, we go to a first break here and from the South Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Tell Us Your English and on my account at Laura Pitelesser. Stay with us. We are back. President Donald Trump has said he would impose tariffs on Mexico if its authorities don't control the border with the United States. This comes just a week after President Trump threatened to close the southern border. If the drugs don't stop, Mexico can stop them if they want. We're going to tariff the cars. The cars are very big. And if that doesn't work, we're going to close the border. But I think that'll work. That's massive numbers of dollars. So if we don't see uh, people apprehended and brought back to their countries. If we see these massive caravans coming up to our country right through Mexico, coming right through Mexico like nothing. In response, the top Mexican trade official said that the trade agreement between Mexico and the United States and Canada is firm regarding the car industry and not under threat. The Mexican ambassador to the United States also addressed the issue. Uh, uh, we are responding on the migration side in a respectful way at the highest level. And then the USMCA, the trade negotiations, are a separate track, a separate window, and we are dealing with that also in a respectful and positive, positive way. I think it's very clear by the various stakeholders in the bilateral relationship that closing the border doesn't help anyone and that it would cause serious harm not just to both countries' economies greatly affecting U.S. border districts and Mexican border cities and states. But it would also damage the trust between both countries and the collaboration we currently have between both countries. And a massive demonstration took place in Argentina to demand that the authorities put an end to austerity measures that are affecting the working class. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Edgardo Esteban, was at the protest and sent us this report earlier. Despite the rain, workers' unions and social movements are gathering in Buenos Aires to protest against the economic policies promoted by the government of Mauricio Macri and the austerity measures they have strengthened since the agreement signed with the International Monetary Fund. 
Demonstrators are marching towards Congress to demand lawmakers concrete actions to stop massive layoffs, to boost national production and to stop the increase in the price of basic services that are affecting the working class. Unions of movement leaders have said that if the government does not announce concrete actions in response to these demands, they will call for a general strike in the upcoming days. This could become the fifth national strike during the government of Mauricio Macri. Thank you, Edgardo. And United Nations General Assembly President Maria Fernanda Espinosa has visited Cuba to boost ties with the government and discuss topics like gender equality. Espinosa has so far met with Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez and she also met with President Miguel Diaz Canel. The top United Nations official also plans to address multilateralism issues while on the island. It's always a pleasure to know that Cuba is an indispensable and strategic ally in the strengthening of the multilateral system, which we know can be complicated at times, that bring with it challenges for building global peace and a multilateral world order that is fairer, more equitable, and more democratic. An estimated 18 million U.S. dollar worth of cocaine was found attached to a vessel at a jetty in Trinidad and Tobago, the tanker registered in Spain was docked at the Atlantic liquefied natural gas port in point for point 14. Police had initially responded to a report of a suspicious item attached to the ship rudder. Coast Guard drivers, divers then retrieved seven large packages of cocaine. It's not the first time this vessel has been found with illegal drugs. They managed to seize uh, quite a lot of narcotics, which appear to be cocaine from the testing last night. Unfortunately, this vessel in 2015, this particular vessel that came from Spain here to fill up with LNG to return to Spain, this particular vessel had an incident in Peru, a similar incident in Peru in 2015. An undercover police could soon be operating in schools across Trinidad and Tobago. The plan was announced by Police Commissioner Gary Griffith to help tackle increasing student violence. The commissioner also announced plans to set up a domestic violence unit. High-tech equipment will enable officers to actually see the location from where a distress call was being made. People will be able to file reports of domestic violence through an online system. In Peru, authorities have launched an investigation into the death of a British pastor and activist whose burnt body was found this Tuesday in the Amazonian city of Iquitos. 71-year-old Paul Macaulay was campaigning against the incursion of oil and mining companies into the Amazonian communities. His body was found in a hostel, he said, up for indigenous students. He found he was he founded an environmental network in 2004 to defend indigenous rights. My name is Paul Macaulay, I'm a Della Salle brother. And I'd say they all need to think about the other species in danger, which are the human species. The, the indigenous people and the riverside people are no longer able to live sustainably in their areas because they've been robbed of their natural resources. And continually they're coming to the cities as refugees. And in Bolivia, a road has collapsed in the capital, La Paz, due to heavy rains. Some residential homes in the suburb of Pasanqueri have been literally left off a cliff edge. More than 30 people have died and over 47,000 families affected by this year's rainy season in the country. We are always going to be worried about our city, given its geography. This is always going to occur in our city, in areas where the geography is weak. These things happen and with the wet season. And the Bolivian government has decided to increase its assistance to neighborhoods in several cities with the aim of providing solutions and improve the living conditions of residents. Let's find out more on the following story. The state program is called Mi Barrio Mi Hogar or My Neighborhood, My Home. Last year, the project made improvements in 56 districts in La Paz and benefited more than 138,000 families in the country. 
We are much better. All this used to be dirt and very slippery. It's much better now. Our president has helped us a lot. It's good to have common houses for young people. We want big venues to give our kids and young people workshops and guidance. The program is implemented through a lottery fund. The interested district, with wide participation from its residents, must develop a project and propose it to the State Social Investment Fund, which chooses the most creative proposal. We want to implement mesh protection for a wooded area. The Fehove La Paz neighborhood is presenting the mesh project for the forest of Purapura. Pura. We are also presenting a tourism plan for the area. The approved projects don't require any money from the district. The maximum amount per project is close to half a million dollars, and the options are many. There are projects about equipment, some are about the environment, and others are about roads. We're looking to improve parks, fields, and social venues, as well as to stabilize or even renovate some surfaces. It's a common concern in La Paz. The program started last year with $10 million. This year, the government announced a $200 million fund for the whole nation as part of the redistribution of economic resources program generated by nationalization of the country's strategic industries. I'm time for a second and very short break. More news when we are back. Welcome back, and now we continue with the serial of stories that our correspondent Oscar Epelde sent us. In this fourth episode, we'll know about a project launched in North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo that is aimed at rewriting the country's history and helping children to take charge of their destiny. In the distance, the Niragongo volcano, which makes it easier for bandits to vanish into nature. At 1840, bandits broke into my place. We were hit and told to lie on the floor. They had weapons. Outside our house, they killed a mother. Further along, they killed a young man and kidnapped his sister. They kidnapped us too, and only released us when they got a load of money. <laughs> At any time, they come and steal from us. We want to live in peace. There are soldiers on the hill. We need them to do their job and protect us. The library is one of the tools that allow children to write about our history and get to know the world, thanks to the books. Every time they come to study, they bring food for the rabbits, leaves which they gather anywhere, and they each bring some kilos of fertile soil to make a civet where they can plant trees. They have to understand that the solutions are always local, and they are the ones who have to apply them. We want to teach children the value of responsibility so they can take control of their own lives. The Leopard Education Program deals with local history, so the children can understand both the potential and the difficulties of their community. Also the history of their people, including the slave trade that went on in the 15th century at the foot of the same volcanoes. They also write about their own personal history. We asked them where they came from. Some of them knew and others didn't. This gave us the chance to assign them homework where they talked to their parents to find out where they come from. Dosho is a young neighborhood. It was formed in 1996. So the children researched their own biographies and wrote about it themselves. This helps to boost their self-esteem. Psychologically, we want to encourage this because not many people in this country can write and research like that. 
It stimulates them. Using local resources, they also made a documentary about Lumumba. They work with a local journalist who has recorded some material, and they produced this film. It wasn't very sophisticated, but it was shown at a festival. It's about Lumumba, and the actors were the children and Mama Prefi. Les entreprises et les églises, la bière et la prière. The documentary tells the story of a teacher who organizes with his students, in spite of all the difficulties, a show about the end of mediocrity. And people in Rwanda are set to commemorate the deadly genocide in the country 25 years after it took place. Annual commemorations are held in Rwanda from April 7 to 13. Afterwards, an honorary three months of remembrance takes place. This period is in observance of the three months which the genocide expanded. Survivors use the annual commemoration as a healing process. The genocide which took place in 1994 resulted in more than 800,000 deaths. Commemorating makes us strong. It helps us achieve what we had not achieved and makes us think what we should stand up for the Rwandan people who have left us to have a better country that is not characterized by ethnicity as it was in the past. A showdown is looming in Libya between forces loyal to Prime Minister Fayez al Sarraf and those belonging to General Khalifa Haftar head of the so-called Libyan National Army. On Wednesday, Haftar ordered his forces to move on to Tripoli and overthrow the Sarraf-led government. Libya has been in turmoil since the NATO-backed overthrow of former leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. It is divided between the Western-backed government base in Tripoli and the Benghazi base allied to Haftar. Heroes, the time has come. It is time to advance towards Tripoli and to enter it peacefully, as you have always done with a firm step. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has expressed his concern at the treatment in mi of migrants in detention centers, speaking after visiting a detention center in Tripoli. Guterres said the conditions under which the migrants are living are shocking. Migrants frequently face abuse, including torture and rape. The majority of them are intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard while trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And like this, we've come to the end of this trip, but you can find this and many other stories on our website, thrusterenglish.net, where, of course, you can find more information, opinion articles, special interviews, and much more information produced by Telesur. Continue with Telesur, connecting the global south. Until next time, thank you for watching. The life is full of...